Recently, there has been an explosion of apps and startups that leverage application programming interfaces or APIs that connect to various different types of AI products from either OpenAI or Google or Microsoft. This is my effort to evaluate an interesting app I found recently to look at it from a hypothetical business model approach. So first off, Adafy is a Chrome-based browser extension that basically does summarizations of your YouTube videos, as you can see right here on the screen. What it's supposed to do is give you a rundown of the video or a summary of the video so that you don't have to watch it. As far as the usability of this app goes, I'm not really sure. I would encourage you to maybe try it out for yourself. Um, I found it to be maybe not super helpful in some of the videos that I tried, but it might be helpful for other videos. It looks like they have 9,000 users now, and uh, their rating is about four stars. Maybe that's a good proxy for how good the product is. So here's their pitch on the Chrome store. You can take a look at that. How this app was built, uh, it seems to very obviously leverage the GPT-3 backend. And there are actually different language model inference servers that OpenAI offers. One is called Curie, which is a simpler one. And then the one that you usually use if you interact with ChatGPT is called DaVinci. That's the really advanced one. So I think what they're using here is Curie, uh, just because it doesn't seem to quite give you that really nice, crisp, human-sounding answer. That's important to know how much this thing costs. All right, let's talk about some hypothetical costs here. The development cost to have a programmer who's working on this thing and developing this thing, I'm going to say that's about 170 k per year. We'll say that's a very well-paid senior developer, or it might be a team of different kinds of uh, developers. Uh, but we're just going to say there's 170 k of development costs. That might be a little bit high, because it really might be just somebody who's doing it in their free time. Secondly, you've got the YouTube API, so it needs to somehow pull down uh, the transcript of YouTube videos. And I did some uh, quick reading and found that that is about $50 a month, and that gives you about 2.5 million requests. So that's about 600 a year, and probably plenty enough to give you whatever you need for uh, basically all of your user requests that you probably have for 9,000 users at this point. For OpenAI's access to the GPT API, you can buy the tokens basically. Tokens are sort of like words and you buy them in lots of a thousand. So you get a thousand tokens, that's roughly about 750 words. Again, there's the different servers you can buy. There's the Curie and there's the DaVinci server. I did the DaVinci server. Uh, for the purposes of this anal analysis. Based on the cost that is listed on the OpenAI website for their API, what I found it to be is about one US cent per 375,000 words. An average uh, conversational rate is about 150 words per minute. That might be a little bit more than what's needed for YouTube because there might be pauses or there might be introductions, music, but we'll just say it's 150 words per minute. And if you have 7,000 users, I guess they have 9,000 now, but I did this calculation with 7,000 a few weeks ago. Uh, summarizing a 10-minute video per day for a year on average. So I would I would say you have around 3.8 billion words per year. So that's about $5,000 worth of OpenAI API cost per year. And then that breaks down to uh, 5,000 per year server cost. Adding all of this up, adding all the compute costs right here, we have the 600 per year and we have the 5,000 per year on the cheap, on the OpenAI GPT server. So that's 5,600 per year. Uh, I'm just going to round up and say there's a bunch of marketing costs and there's a bunch of marketing server costs and other things, domain name, etc. So it's probably closer to 10,000 a year. There might be fees that you have to pay to get onto the web store for the Google Chrome plugin app that they have I'm not really sure but we're just gonna say the total is around 10,000 per year alright so that's the total right there so now that we've talked about costs let's talk about revenue there are a variety of ways that one could hypothetically monetize a Chrome plugin app right so you have a very popular business model which was basically whitelisted ads you know you could you could basically deliver ads within the actual plugin itself uh, there was another business model which has been more invalidated in recent years just due to regulatory changes, which is called uh, third-party cookie injection. So that's basically the, hey, they're stealing your data, they're stealing your browsing data, they're taking data from what you do in the app, and they are feeding that back to some server, and they're selling that data somewhere where it's getting sold again to an advertiser to target you, 
So that is not as common anymore. The reason why is because there was some laws passed in the state of California that disallow that type of activity or just make it very expensive. And Google kind of just started to regulate some of its products and they kick you off of their web store if they catch you doing that type of thing. So it's just not very common anymore. You get around four cents per user per month. So again, at that 7,000 user figure that we had found earlier, uh, that's gonna be around 3,000 360 per year is that right yep but uh, you know if you actually look at their website and if you actually sign up for the app you can see that that's not their business model at all they actually have uh, a, not really a subscription based business model but they give you the ability to buy tokens they give you the ability to buy the capability to summarize more YouTube videos so um, you might think about that as more of a subscription service or just a paid-for service. So we can do some basic math to break down what kind of revenue they might be getting based on that kind of service. Uh, again, they have 9,000 users, but only a certain percentage of those users are actually ever going to buy anything. So if we assume, I'm going to go back to the 7,000 users since I had done the calculations previously, but if we assume around 5,000 of their users go for this paywall and start buying additional credits, to summarize more videos, $10 per month per user, that's gonna be about $120 a year per user. I don't know, they might be getting more. You just have to look at their packaging as in their offerings, which might change over time. But let's just say it's about $120 per year per user. I think I, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong on this, but I think I had found that the break even on 5,600 was around 83 users. Um, so I'll say that at 5,600, I'll just change the color here at 5,600 server costs. Just looking a little bit at the product and pricing. When you sign up, you're, you sign up as a free user, but then they give you these credits that you can buy. Uh, you get 20 credits for eight dollars and sixty cents so that's part of where I'm coming up with this 120 per user per year figure um, but again they do have expanded offerings and you can get up to 180 credits for for 4860 so if somebody's summarizing 180 YouTube videos per year and they are within that 83 users pool uh, you know they're actually paying forty or forty eight or fifty dollars per month approximately to this this company, so there could be a wide range of the types of revenue that they could be seeing you know just looking at a per user um one hundred twenty dollars per year uh, you know core set of users uh, maybe it's a hundred users that are paying that um, your break even on your server cost is a lot more realistic all right, so let's talk about hypothetical profitability. Based on some of these assumptions I made up here, if we ignore the uh, top uh, cost here, if we top, if we ignore this dev cost, the very large dev cost, so based on all those assumptions ab above, you could be looking at a twenty thousand to fifty thousand per year business in profitability. Um, of course, they've got a growth rate going on. So if the last time I looked at it, yeah, they were at seven thousand users and now they're at 9,000, and that was at about two weeks ago, so that they're at about 1,000 users per week. So that means that that revenue could be going up a little bit more than I think, and it could be even higher than that 50,000 per year revenue. Again, assuming that they have good adoption on their actual YouTube summaries. Again, that DaVinci server cost, you know, this is 5,000 per year on DaVinci, but if they're using Curie, which is the lower quality server, then it's gonna be more like 500 per year. But there's a lot of problems with using Curie. Um, uh, maybe I'll have to talk about that in a different video. Um, I don't think they're using Curie. I think they're probably using DaVinci at this point. So you wanna to get to, let's say you wanna to get to a million dollars per year. That, let's say the lower credit price, just to be conservative, which is 27 cents, how many credits are they gonna to have to sell? So they're going to have to sell, they have to sell 3.7 million YouTube video summaries. So, you know, YouTube has uh, 
2 billion users, and um, if they get a huge number of users, that could be within the realm of possibility. At 9,000 users, I can't see them selling that many, so they definitely need to gain a huge number of users. All right, so talking about this, uh, you know, $50,000 per year business is all well and good, might sound great for an uh, individual developer just hacking along on it and growing it, but of course there's always risk involved in all these things. $50,000 is, uh, you know, of course anybody could go after that, anybody could copy this idea right now. It's literally just using the open AI API and just using the Chrome web store, which anybody who has the capability to do that and the skills to be able to do that can go after that same pool of money. And so now you have competition. If you don't have some sort of differentiating factor, it's going to be very easy for copycat businesses to pop up and start picking away at that. So copycats are a huge uh, issue. Uh, the other thing here is the this company, Adafi, which developed the product in the first place, they actually put time into thinking about some of the user interface, how to set up the entire business model. They put a lot of time and thought into making sure this is a good product. Copycat comes along, they just directly copy everything. They just directly copy the user interface, the product, and uh, they didn't have to do any work. So there's all that kind of admin overhead creative marketing product work that copycats don't have to do and if there was any cost involved in that product work I mean it was obviously made by a very talented person so that talented person's time has an opportunity cost to it and they could have been doing something else they might have been contracting or working a different job and that just kind of went in the toilet if a copycat comes in and steals a ton of their revenue. Another potential risk is anybody could go online and grab a transcript for a video for free and then just go plug it into ChatGPT or whatever other open free summarizer and get the summary of a YouTube video. So people could basically just substitute Adafi by using already available free tools and so that's another problem is just the product itself might not have that much value because people might realize they can just kind of do it themselves. The real value to the product seems to be in the UX. It seems to be making sure that this is a great wrapper around that AI API and making sure that that user is very satisfied and be able to just click a button and have the YouTube video summarized for them very conveniently right on the page right there and maybe it's something that they can go back to and reference. Maybe it's a way, maybe they have a way to easily port those notes over to some other kind of interface. I'm not sure, but it just seems like a lot of the value in this is just purely UX. There's that substitution risk, and they're going to have to make sure that they've got an excellent UX involved in their product because it's not an AI product. It's not a purely AI product on its own. Um, they don't have a lot of intellectual property on their own that they've built so they just have to really make sure they do an excellent job providing that service so overall assessment this might be a great at-home business hobby project this might be something that a singular or a small team of engineers can put together and maintain on their own as long as they provide that excellent service excellent uptime as long as they um, are making sure that the UX is responsive and what users are looking for, then they might have a great product and they might have a great ongoing revenue stream. It doesn't have to be, not all businesses have to be this amazing, off the wall, just profitable, you know, 100% growth per month, per quarter, whatever type of profitability. You can build a nice income stream on the side and that's okay. If not for an individual, maybe it's for a small company that has a bunch of different Chrome apps that it provides in a portfolio. And that uh, portfolio of apps can work up into building and helping to grow an overall business as a diversified portfolio. It's, it's probably better as a portfolio project because of some of these risks that we mentioned above, uh, these risks that you have could result in your income stream just being dropped at the drop of a hat. So you 
you really want that to be a portfolio project. If you can, you really want that to be integrated in with other income streams. If it's your side project and then you lose that $50,000 per year um, or more, that's pretty sad. So this has been a different type of video for me. I've put together some videos on actual AI and the mathematics behind AI. If you like this kind of content, please comment below. Uh, please let me know how I can improve or if I made any mistakes. And if you'd like to see more of this type of content, you know, I'm happy to build it. I was thinking of making a series of these and just kind of going through some of the different types of AI businesses that are out there and looking at what are the good business models, what are the maybe not so good business models. Um, I didn't look at this at, uh, from a very long range approach. I just looked at this as here's what I have, here's the information I have. I don't necessarily know what's going to happen next year, but going over a year or six months time frame, this is probably pretty good. Um, so again, love to hear what you think of this video and uh, how I can improve and if you'd like me to keep doing this series. If you're curious about large language models in general, check out some of my other videos that I have. Those other videos go into more of the details of how this stuff gets built, what's some of the magic behind the actual AI, and maybe even some of why it's so expensive. I could go into that in detail in a future video if you'd like. Again, comment below, let me know what else you'd like to see from me. Thanks so much for watching.